Well, it's very good to see everybody here this morning. It is still morning, just for a little while longer. If you are a visitor with us today, and this is your first time meeting with the Monte Vista congregation, then please fill out one of the visitor's cards. You'll find that in the rack in the pew in front of you. At the end of our worship today, we'll be passing around a basket to collect any of those visitor's cards. We would love to get to know you, find out what kind of spiritual needs that you have, and sit down and study the Bible together with you. If there's anything at all that we can help you with, please let us know, and we would love to do that. We're going to be talking about friendship today because it is said by one poet that there's happiness in little things, there's joy in passing pleasure, but friendships are from year to year the best of all life's treasure. We've been very blessed here at Monte Vista in the way that we've grown over the years. We have a lot of new faces, even just in the last six months. And I do know of another couple that's going to be moving to the area from Ohio in just the next couple weeks, so we might even have some more new faces. And it is such a blessing to have new people. Uh, it's such a blessing to get to know them and to welcome them into our group, to find out what makes them tick and what kind of tools and skills they have to offer here at Monte Vista to help us continue to grow personally and as a congregation. But a congregation that is growing can have growing pains. And that is a biblical idea, by the way. You can read in the New Testament in several places that we'll talk about here for just a few minutes of growing pains that congregations in that time period experienced. For example, even though we typically think of it as a very positive chapter, we read in Romans chapter 12 that Paul had to go out of his way to teach the congregation in Rome how to be friendly with each other that Paul felt like it was worth his time and worth their time to spend an entire chapter talking about things like service and hospitality and practicing love and giving with liberality and cheerfulness and being, as it says in verse 10, devoted to one another in brotherly love and giving preference to one another in honor. He says down in verse 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who, who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Practically, the entire chapter could be summed up in the words, Be nice to each other. Be friendly to each other. Corinth needed to hear some things about friendliness as well. And again, while 1 Corinthians tends to have a lot of very positive things in it as well, there are some things in 1 Corinthians that are downright harsh if you really read them. In chapter 6, for example, the church at Corinth lacked friendliness to such a degree that Paul criticized them for suing each other. Now, I don't think Monte Vista will ever reach that point, and I know that it hasn't in the past, but think about what it would be like to be a member of a congregation that was so at odds with each other that members were suing each other. That's tough. Corinth needed to learn a thing or two about friendliness to the point that in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul actually has to give them a working definition of what love is. When you have to be taught what love is, it means that there's some areas of your love that need to be grown a little bit. That maybe you're missing something, lacking something. In the book of James, in James chapter 2, James has to write to the people in that audience to be very careful with how they treat each other when it comes to economic differences in the congregation. He starts James chapter 2 with verse 1, writing, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And he goes on to explain the problem in that church was that there were rich members who were given places of honor and respect, and there were poorer people visiting that congregation who were told to sit in the back and stay where we don't have to look at you or smell you or deal with you. Now, don't tell me that that congregation didn't need to learn a thing or two about friendliness and being welcoming to people. This issue of friendliness in a congregation is a biblical idea. And as we grow, not only do we have to practice friendship with new people, new faces, welcoming them into the group, helping them feel like this actually is a spiritual family, but we have to make sure that we continue to cultivate relationships of people who are already here. 
So those relationships are not left lagging behind or neglected in some way. We need to remember something. That within a congregation of Christians, it's not just that we're here like this is Weight Watchers or a Boy Scout meeting. We don't just have some shared mutual interest in spiritual things. We are brothers and sisters. We are sheep of the same flock. We're to depend on each other, to lean on each other, to love each other, and to give preference to one another in honor. We must be friends with each other, first and foremost. Now it starts with love. Because if it doesn't start with love, I don't know what else you can put in its place. Here's a couple of passages of Scripture for you to think about on this subject. In 1 John 3 and verse 16, it says, We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Our friendship must be to such a degree that we'd be willing to lay down our lives just as Jesus laid down His life for us. 1 John 4 and verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And if we can learn to love each other, what John is saying is we learn to love God. We show our love for God in how we love each other. In chapter 4 and verse 11 of the same book, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And I'm impressed here that of all the characteristics that could have been named as the most distinguishing thing among Christians, it is love that is always at the top. And Jesus Himself said the same thing in John chapter 13, verse 35, in His own words, By this all men will know that you are My disciples if you have love for one another. Here's something to think about by way of practical application. A lot of churches today, and I hate to criticize any other church out there, it's not really my place to be the critic or modern day apostle, but it's hard to ignore that many churches out there brand themselves in one way or another. That this is a church for this. We're a church for families. You you always wonder about that, right? When a sign on the outside of the building says, a family church, a place for families. Like, well, what about the single person or the divorcee? They don't have a place in your congregation. Or this church over here, this is a fun church over here. We offer all kinds of amenities and things to distract you in playgrounds and for adults and for children in some cases. Other churches will say, we're a very, we're, we're a very charity-minded congregation. Or social justice issues, that's, that's what we put on the sign. That's what we're known for. And I wonder for Monte Vista, will people know us by our love? Jesus says, all men will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love each other. And you can't put that on a sign out front. Nobody would believe that, right? Monte Vista Church of Christ, a place where we love each other. You've got to be a cornball to go there. You can't put that on a sign, though. He says, they'll know it by how you act. And they'll know you're my disciples because of how you love each other. That's something that we have to show, we have to practice, and that we have to hone. We've got to be friends. We've got to love each other. And while this might sound like a very flowery approach to take to church life, real love is more than just something flowery. And we have to keep that in mind, that every time that John or Jesus or Paul writes about love, they're not just talking about the flowery, hippy-dippy version of love. They're talking about a real, meaty, substantial kind of love. A love that stands through thick and thin. A love that will tell you hard truths, even when those truths are very uncomfortable or difficult to say. That is love when you don't feel like loving. It's a loving your enemies kind of love. A praying for your enemies. That's the kind of love that we read about in the Bible. And that love might not initially be driven by affection. But it is driven and motivated by our respect for God and every one of His creatures. A couple other verses to think about. 2 Peter 1, verse 7, "...and in your godliness you must supply brotherly kindness." 1 Peter 2, verse 17, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. 
1 Peter 1, verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Hebrews 13, verse 1. Let love of the brethren continue. And I think what he means by that is keep cultivating it. Keep working on it. Or as Paul would write to the Thessalonians, you have no need to, no need to have anything written to you about your love. All I tell you now is excel still more. Can we be that congregation that we already love each other, but can we be doing better? Another aspect of friendship that I think needs to be cultivated is trustworthiness. Trust is such a powerful ally in establishing and maintaining good friendships. After all, if you don't trust somebody else, or if you yourself cannot be trusted, I think there's very little that can ever get accomplished in a group of people trying to work together. If you don't trust me, why would you listen to me every Sunday? If I don't trust you, why would I stay? If we can't trust each other across one aisle to the other, from one pew to the next, across generational lines as well, from old to young, if we can't trust each other, there's really not much that Montevist is going to accomplish as a congregation. When you learn to trust one another, when we learn to become trustworthy, a genuine state of accomplishment can be found. To learn to cultivate trust in our relationships, we first must understand that it has to be earned. You can't just buy trust. It's not bought and sold like a cheap product of Walmart. It must be practiced. It must be nurtured through years and years of hard work and proven reliability. That's why when you read about the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7, trustworthiness or reliability is one of the things that an elder must have. And elders can't just buy that overnight. They have to have that reputation that is earned through years and years of work. The same applies to widows in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 10. That if widows are going to be put on a register uh, to be taken care of by the congregation, they must show and have a reputation for trustworthiness. Young men in Titus 2 verse 8 must be shown to be trustworthy. Deacons must be trustworthy in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 10. Christians in general must be trustworthy according to Romans 13 and verse 13. And if we don't practice trustworthiness in our lives, we will never earn anybody's trust. The second thing about trustworthiness, though, is that we need to acknowledge that it can be broken. That once you've earned somebody's trust, you must continually keep it as if it is a fine piece of china. It can be chipped, it can be cracked, and it can be shattered if you drop it on the floor. Consider the story of John Mark, for example, who was a cousin of the Apostle Barnabas. We read in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, how this man abandoned Barnabas and Paul while they were on one of their missionary journeys. Now, from that reference, it doesn't seem like much. It simply says that he decided to go home. But when you read about it a little bit later on, you see in Acts chapter 15, verse 38, so a few years later, a couple of chapters down the road, Barnabas wants John Mark to go with them on another missionary journey. And Paul puts his foot down and explains that he doesn't want to have somebody on their journey that he can't trust. Because the first time we brought John Mark with us, he abandoned us. And that's the word used in New American Standard, is he abandoned us. Now, it's not like Paul took issue with John Mark's Christianity. Perhaps John Mark was simply young, inexperienced, and immature, and in the heat of the moment made a bad choice in his immaturity. He wanted to go home. Maybe he didn't listen to Luke chapter 9 very clearly when Jesus said, nobody, when you put your hands to the plow, nobody is allowed to look back at home and long for hearth and home. But Paul didn't want him. He couldn't trust him. And he's not going to put his trust in somebody who's shown to be untrustworthy. Now, the nice thing, of course, is that when you read later on in Colossians 4 and verse 10, Paul actually calls John Mark a very useful person in the work of the gospel. So at some point, John Mark earned Paul's trust back. But I think we need to keep in mind, you can lose trust. 
you can lose a reputation for trustworthiness. So how trustworthy are you? Are you trustworthy when it comes to people's secrets? Or are you a talebearer, like it says in Proverbs 11, verse 13? He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy conceals a matter. How about this? Do you shirk your responsibilities? And do you cause your brethren to lose faith in you? Like Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38 says, My righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we're not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Can people trust you? Or are you one who shrinks back from your responsibilities? Trust is absolutely important if we're going to build Christian friendships with each other. Now, if I'm expected to lay down my life for a brother in 1 John 3, verse 16, and if I'm expected to go after him when he falls away from the faith in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and if I'm expected to help him with physical needs in, in James chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, then don't I need to actually know somebody? Don't I need to be familiar with somebody? To take the time to get to know some. If I don't know you, then I don't know what problems you have. And I don't know what needs you have. And I don't know how I can be helpful to you. Maybe as a little bit of a plug for one of our goals this year that our elders announced recently, we're going to be adding a deacon or possibly two deacons to a, a job here at Monte Vista. And it's going to serve as a liaison of sorts between needy Christians in the congregation and our elders to make sure that our elders know who has a physical or a spiritual need or a problem in your relationships, your marriage, or even a psychological need if you're suffering from de depression and it's being left untreated. <coughs> our elders want to know you. And they're going to put a deacon in place to help make sure that that information gets to them in time. But you have to be willing to share. And that's on you. That's on you to be willing to share when you actually do have a physical or spiritual need of some kind. You know, church is one of those words that we use in a lot of different contexts, unfortunately. And sometimes we talk about church like it's just a thing that we go to. Like I said, like a Weight Watchers meeting or a Boy Scout troop or going to see a movie at a movie theater. But you know what? At the end of the movie, you get up and walk away and you don't have a relationship with the actors in that movie. And when you're done with Weight Watchers, you've left that context, right? And your relationship to other people in the group is only within that context, at least for the most part. Church is not like that. Church is not something that you go to and then leave. It has to be more than that. And if you don't feel like you're getting anything out of church, then maybe the problem is that we don't know each other. So what I would like to do then is get very practical here and just give some tips on how to get to know each other. You might be thinking, well, why do we need to have tips to get to know each other? Well, there's different personalities. Everybody's different. Some people are more willing to talk, others are not. And if you're not equipped with the skills or the tools yet to get to know people, then I would like to just offer you a few tools that maybe you can use. And maybe if you're already good at getting to know people, these are some things, some suggestions that you can use to get even further out of your comfort zone. And by the way, we do have this thing here at Monte Vista, and we joke about it. I get it. We joke about it. I don't think anybody takes it seriously. But is there not a bit of a divide between the front half of the auditorium and the back half of the auditorium? And it's interesting how we all get to know the people who sit near us. We all get to know the people who go out the same door as we do, this door or the one in the back. You ever thought about sometimes moving to a different door at the end of worship? Switching spots, you know, so that worship is over, we finish with the last song, and you go to the other door, and you meet all the other people in the auditorium <laughs> who are here every Sunday. It's an amazing thing, isn't it, when you leave your own comfort zone, even if that comfort zone literally is a zone. It's amazing how quickly you get to know people. So just some things to think about, some practical tips 
to log away in your toolbox of building friendships. The first one is this, ask about people's life stories. If you don't know somebody, the best way to get to know them is interview them. And people love to be interviewed. I and mean, if anything, if anything, People love to talk about themselves if they're uncomfortable talking about anything else. And that's not because we're selfish or egotistical or anything. It's just that we know ourselves. I know where my hometown is, and I know what I do for a living, and I know what my hobbies are. So if you don't know somebody, then consider asking questions like that. Where were you raised? Was it a big town or a small town? Where'd you go to college and what did you study? What kind of sports did you do in high school? Were you in band? Really? So was I. What musical instrument did you play? Great. That's a conversation that's just built into your own memories. And you start to build connections with people. And it's amazing, after five minutes, you will find something that you have in common with somebody. I promise. You will find something if you mine deep enough. You might have to mine pretty deep with some people. But if you mine deep enough, you will find something that you share with them. Be helpful and be available as well. There are very few people who have an aversion to those who are eager and happy to serve. So when things come up like someone needs help moving, are you there to help them? Are you there to help out? And that's not the only thing, obviously. Are you there for people when they go to the hospital? Are you there for people to hold their hand when a loved one passes away? Are you there for people when they need help managing their finances or managing their young children? Are you there for people when you can tell that their car is on its last leg and maybe could use a little bit of a tune-up? Are you there for people to help them? Because like I said, one of the easiest ways to build a friendship with somebody is to just be available to help them with the things that are on their mind in their life right now. Galatians 5 verse 13 says, but through love we serve one another. Through love we serve one another. Dig deeper into what makes a fellow Christian strong. Now this is going beyond just where were you raised and what college did you go to. This is taking the conversation to the next level. Ask who people's great influences were. Who influenced you to become a Christian? Who has left the greatest impression on you? Who are some preachers that you've heard over the years that, that are your favorite preachers? What's your favorite book of the Bible or a favorite verse in the Bible? What are things in the Bible that you struggle with? Things that you don't understand or that you'd like to understand a little bit better? These are deeper questions that we can ask that get to the core of who a person is in the expression of their faith. Stop allowing excuses to prevent you from attending all of the great and uplifting activities that go on here at Monte Vista. There's always something going on. At least once a month there's an activity of some kind going on. Whether it's a prayer meeting or singing at somebody's house or going to a retirement home and singing a potluck of some kind, a social activity that's going on. There's always something going on. And I know that there's always an excuse you can use not to go. I know. There's always something on TV. There's always something to distract you. I get it. We all have distractions. We all have a lot of things on our plate. Stuff going on with our kids. Stuff going on with our jobs. But you are shortchanging yourself when you live in the world of excuse making. Be accessible. Linger a little bit after worship. I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, but if you don't think Monte Vista is friendly and you're the one going through the exit 30 seconds after the last song is sung, I don't think it's the rest of the congregation's problem with friendliness. And if you don't want to be here, I mean, I understand that things come up. Situations come up. I get that. We need to leave real quick and right away. I just think we need to be honest with ourselves and say, there's not room for complaint or criticism. That's all I'm saying. There's not room for complaint or criticism. If you're not sticking around for 5, 10, or 15 minutes after worship to get to know your brothers and sisters here at Monte Vista, and while you should never force a relationship to happen, don't be afraid of being proactive about it. 
Try to find people here who you don't think have a lot of friends. And you be the one to get out of your comfort zone and say hi to them in some way. Find a creative way of getting to know them, some similarity that you have, something that you can do to strike up a conversation and be proactive about it. Ask somebody to go to lunch. Set up plans to get together with other Christians. Make sure that a member who is maybe a little bit on the fringes of the congregation knows that they're invited to the ladies class, to a men's class, to a prayer meeting, to a singing. Make sure that they know that they're welcome to those things if they have never been overtly or obviously invited to any of those activities. And the last thing on this point is, be very careful not to present yourself as a one-dimensional person. Now what I mean by this is that sometimes we come to a congregation with a lot of issues, spiritual problems, and burdens. And we're expected to. And we're expected to bear one another's burdens. So I'm not saying at all that we keep our problems secret. But I fear that what happens sometimes is that we come to a congregation with this list of burdens, spiritual problems, material problems perhaps, physical issues. We come with so many problems and that's all we ever show people of ourselves. That's the only thing we ever share about ourselves. All we are to people then is a prayer request. Are we all, are we, all we are to people is a physical need that keeps coming up over and over and over again. And we need to be really careful with that. Because all we're doing is presenting ourselves as just a one-dimensional person. That all I am is my prayer request. Or all I am is my spiritual problem. Or all I am is my material or physical problem. No, you're more than that. You're absolutely, positively more than that. You are more than your divorce. You are more than your debt. You are more than your physical disability. You are more with that sinful habit that you are having a very hard time battling. You're more than that. So stop presenting yourself as nothing but that. And here's the hard truth. Pity is a terrible foundation upon which to build friendships. And if all you're looking for from a congregation is pity me, pity me, pity me, don't be surprised if you have a very hard time making friendships with people. Now again, I want to emphasize, we need to come to each other with our burdens. That's why we come together, to help each other. Just make sure that people know there's more to you than that. There's more to you than that. We need to assume the best about each other. Because in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7, it says, Love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, love endures all things. So one of the great impediments to healthy friendships in a congregation is the tendency to assume the worst about other people. Proverbs 13, verse 10, for example, says, Through presumption comes nothing but strife. <laughs> What that verse means is that when you always assume the worst about everybody else, you assume that somebody has it out for you, or somebody's jealous of you in some way, or you assume that somebody's trying to stab you in the back or manipulate some situation to where you get it in the end. When you always assume that life is a conspiracy against you, well, don't be surprised when life turns out to be full of strife and trouble. And it hurts a congregation through presumption. I've always loved that. Through presumption comes nothing but strife. Proverbs 12, verse 18. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrusts of a dagger, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And which one are you doing? Which one are you doing? Don't assume the worst about everybody. Sometimes we might hear things like, well, I had that couple or that family over last month, but I haven't been invited to their house yet. I've been in their house so many, or I, they've been to my house so many times, but I've never been to their house. I helped that person move in, but they weren't there for me when I needed help moving something. So we kind of keep this like running laundry list in our minds of all the things I've done for that person and that person. And I visited that person in the hospital, but they didn't come when my baby was born. You know, there's a lot of reasons why maybe somebody wasn't there at that particular case. 
be very careful not to assume the worst about everybody around you. Instead, assume the best. Assume the best about each other. Assume that sometimes we're forgetful and we overlook something. Assume that that card that you haven't gotten yet, maybe it's in the mail right now and it's going to come tomorrow. Assume that that person who you really thought ought to visit you maybe had problems of her own or his own that prevented that. Assume that there's always a good reason. Because I'll tell you what, it is better in life to assume the very best about people than to constantly assume the worst and hem yourself in through negative and bitter thinking. And the last point I'll make this morning is this. We must be building fibers of friendship in a congregation. And I'm going to get a little corny with you. I'm sorry. Some of my analogies are really corny. Some of my analogies are just downright bad. This one's just corny. You ever heard of the term tensile strength? Have you ever worked at an airport or anything? What's tensile strength? It's the strength of the material of your briefcase or your suitcase or your luggage. It's the strength of the material in the, in the shoulder strap in your car, your seat belt. Tensile strength is the measurement of how strong a material is. So for something like a seatbelt or a suitcase, you really want to have high tensile strength. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from having many fibers woven together. The more fibers, the stronger those fibers are, the better. In the book of Ecclesiastes, for example, and I know this is a verse that we've read a number of times in the past, but when the writer of Ecclesiastes talks about friendship in Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9, he has this to say, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. And if that's true of a cord of three strands, imagine what it would be like with a cord of 200 strands at Monte Vista. To have 200 people bound together in love and friendship. Now the reality is this. You can't have 200 really close friends. I mean, I can't. I don't think most people are capable of that. I, I would say most people are capable of maintaining about a hundred really close friendships. Facebook maybe gives us a, a false sense of friendship or the illusion of having, well, I've got a thousand friends. You don't, I'm, you know, you, you go through your Facebook friends list, you go, how do I know that person again? We, realistically, we can have maybe a hundred people that we're really close with. So when a congregation gets to be 200 members or 300 or 400 or even more than that, how do you build friendships with that many people? Well, here's my challenge to you. I believe this is the answer. Just do what you can. And if you can get out of your comfort zone and build a friendship with just, just a couple more people, just a couple of people that you weren't friends with before, that you, you knew nothing about them before except for their, their, their face on the picture board out here. If you can just get out of your comfort zone and just get to know just a couple more people, and I'll get to know a couple more people, and if, and if he gets to know a couple more people, and if she gets to know a couple more people, and if all of us work together just doing what we can, to build a few more friendships in Monte Vista. All it does is it just creates fibers in the congregation. These fibers of friendship. A little fiber between these people. And a strand between these people. And a weave between these people. And it increases the overall tensile strength of the congregation. And as one group of people, we become stronger together. That's my challenge for you. I don't think it's realistic to say that you have to be buddy-buddy with every single person in every congregation that you're ever going to be a member of in your life. But you can get out of your comfort zone and find somebody, 
a few people, a couple of people that you weren't friends with before and push yourself just a bit to just add that fiber of friendship that makes us all stronger. Now, if you're not a Christian here this morning, you really ought to be. You need to become a Christian. You need to listen to the gospel, which in short is he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, according to Mark 16, verse 16. If you'd like to be a part of God's kingdom and have all of your sins washed away, or if you are a Christian and not been living right, maybe that's the reason why you've had a hard time making friends, because you've been living a life of hypocrisy. You come and you look the part of the Christian, but you failed to live it day in and day out. Whatever spiritual need you have, please let it be known by coming forward as we stand and sing.